Welcome to another <laughs> Dragonland Saga review episode as I'm tongue-tied tripping over myself. It is Kirinor, New Cold to 26, and uh, my name is Adam. Today I have a spoiler review of Kaz the Minotaur. This is the sequel to The Legend of Huma by Richard A. Nack, and uh, I'm going to give you spoiler information here. So, I've been called out on it in the discussions. So in the comments and stuff, so make sure you understand. If you watch this, I'm going to tell you the story. And if you don't want to know the story, you're 35 years late. <laughs> I don't know, 30 years late, 20 years late. You're late. It's, you should have read it by now. And you should read it because it's really good. So let's get into that. But before we do, I'd like to take a moment and thank the uh, members of this YouTube channel. I invite you to consider becoming a member, if you're not already, by using the links in the description below. You can uh, even pick up Dragon's Gaming Materials using my affiliate link. Now that that's out of the way. The way this works is I'm going to give you my opinion, which you are wholeheartedly welcome to disagree with. And if you do, put it up in chat. I'm going to give you my pre-written review, and then afterwards we can just sort of riff a little bit and have a little bit of fun. It's hump day. So, so let's hump <laughs> over Cast the Minotaur. It'll be fun. All right, here we go. We open... With a band of minotaurs hunting Kaz. They believe that he's a coward because of a lie about how he killed the minotaur master he was a slave to. Not that he killed him, how he killed him. So there's Minutia with honor, apparently. Uh, they're led by Moloch, an ogre who is surprisingly skilled at manipulating the individual minotaurs into thinking and acting as he wants them to. They have traveled much of southern Ancelon and decided to travel north, believing that Kaz will be returning to Vingard Keep because of a bounty notice the Knights of Salamnia have posted about him. Now, the notice states that Kaz is wanted for crimes against Salamnia, and as Kaz saw it, he could not believe it. Many of the other names that he found on the actual document also fought the Dark Queen beside him. It turns out that the knighthood had somehow gone awry in the years after the war. This is set five years after the last Dragon War. Um, they turned from helping the displaced to making them serfs under their rule. Now, there's a rumor that Lord Oswald is ill and Bennett will soon take the knighthood over. What's great about this so far is that we get to see into the mind of a veteran who is suffering from what seems to be PTSD. He tries his best to live up to the expectations of his dead best friend, Huma, and at times struggles against his own nature and societal teachings. He's met up with a kender. Of course, you always have to have a kender in every story. In this particular case, it works really well. So the kender's name is Delbin Not Willow, who is young and is wandering, but is deferred to Kaz for some of his behaviors. And there's also a white dread wolf hunting them, who in a dream asks about Galen Dracos' citadel. Now, this is a huge foreshadowing moment in this novel, because ultimately what we realize, and I'm going to get into here at the end, Galen Dracos is alive still, in a manner of speaking, in a fistendantilous manner of speaking. He's attached his sort of wraith-like essence to the object that he created that Huma destroyed at the end of the last novel. First novel. Outside Zax Saroth, which we are currently in Prey Cataclysm right now, so you have to understand that Zax Saroth was a bustling city. It was actually a slaver city, too, which I read in some other place. But it, it was a large city, so it, like a metropolis, you know, like a Chicago or something. It, you know, contrasting beautifully with how we first were introduced to Zax Saroth being this multi tiered uh, city on a, a hill, sort of falling down a cliff. So there's this really nice juxtaposition of ideas about what this place is. Anyway, Kaz runs into remnants of the Dark Queen's army, turned mercenaries. They chase him into a wood where Kaz meets them in battle, but then a patrol of Salamnic knights ride in and chase them both. Kaz gets away, but accidentally, uh, by accidentally leading the knights into even more of those mercenaries of the dragon armies. Once Delvin finds him, they head north toward Vingard Keep and his... Uh, Oh, as is suspected by his pursuers. He's obligated to get to the bottom of the bounty notice. Now, here's something that, you know, when I first started reading this, I was like, why, why would you ride willingly into the lion's den? But he, in everything that Kaz is doing, he is guided by what would Huma do? You know, people do that thing, like, what would Jesus do? Huma is Kaz's Jesus, 100%. 
So he is doing everything he can to try to live up to the sacrifice that his best friend made, not just for him, but for all of humanity. And for a minotaur to be doing that speaks to the, I don't know, the graciousness or the, the self-destructive nature, perhaps, of Kaz. That he's literally riding into the lion's den, knowing they want him executed, in order to find out what's wrong. Now, clearly, this is not the first time, and it's certainly not going to be the last time, that the Knights of Salamnia have gone awry, right? You would wonder why anyone would ever have thought the Knights of Salamnia were ever a good organization in all of its history, if it weren't for those brief moments, those brief periods of heroism that are then foreshadowed or, or completely blotted out by all of the ridiculousness that the knighthood finds itself in constantly. Mostly by their own fault of adhering to the oath and the measure, but sometimes because they're just painted that way. I digress. He arrives at a small settlement where he's tricked into looking for goblins that turn out to be minotaur hunters. They end up capturing him, and Kaz realizes that he actually tutored two of them, brother and sister Hekar and Haladi. They believe that honorable tales of Kaz, even though the rest of the Minotaurs don't. A cleric of Mishakal from the settlement rescues Kaz from the Minotaurs, and they travel across a river to escape them, but Kaz's mount is struck by a spear from his pursuers, and he succumbs to the power of the river current and passes out, swept downstream. This is a theme in this novel. Whenever Richard Knack can't figure out how to get the hero from point A to point B, because he would naturally be murdered and the story would end, he just has the hero pass out and then wake up in a fortuitous position. This is a trope that we first experienced in Legend of Huma, which we're like, okay, Huma should have died twice before he even faces Galen Dracos at all, but he just survives through it because eh, it's the story, right? Except for the fact that he's writing the story. Why not write it better? Like, this is what's so frustrating about all of this. You could easily come up with reasons for Kaz not to die by drowning in the river as you set him up to drown. But instead, it's just, he passes out, time passes, and he wakes up. Why? Oh, you know, because elves found a minotaur dead in the river, and so they decided to deliver him to another elf. Like elves always do, because it's not like elves and minotaurs are natural enemies. So why wouldn't they do that? Makes no narrative sense. So if you're going to follow along with any of Richard Knack's writing, you just have to assume the hero will never die and the bad guy will always fail and there are no consequences. Period. None. There are some moments in this story. This sucks because I actually do really enjoy this story. But the more I think about it, the more I pick it apart, the worse it gets. There are moments where you are led to believe that there are genuine consequences in the story, as there were with Legend of Huma. And you think that it makes the character better or it makes the scene better because of the gravity of those consequences until you realize that no one ever actually suffers the consequence. In this entire story, anyone of any substance, only one of them die. And is the one that shouldn't have died. But that being said, hey, Benjamin, thanks for joining live. All right, so Kaz wakes in a tree hut owned by Sardal, speak of the devil, Sardal Crystalthorn, a Quilisty elf wizard. The elves discovered his dying body and brought him here. Sardal has been healing him for weeks. Kaz tells his story and Sardal, now here's the other thing. Oh, I don't want to get too derailed here. <laughs> I really do like Legend of Human, but it is flawed. Not as flawed as this, but it is very flawed. Um, why is Kaz so open with everyone at all times? He keeps nothing under his sleeve, which makes no sense, when you, especially when you think about the experiences that he's had. He gets rescued by a knight of Slamny who has to work at proving himself to be a good friend, Huma. In which case, Kaz only trusts Huma, the only human he's ever trusted, even the other Knights of Slamnia that he's fought with, he still kind of feels a little shady about them, and they are straight up bigoted towards him. So there's no reason for him to trust them openly and honestly. And elves, Minotaurs are spawned from ogres through the Grey Gem. Elves and Minotaurs have had a long history of turmoil and raiding and murder 
and there's no reason why any elf should ever trust a minotaur, and there's no reason why any minotaur should ever trust an elf. So then why would Kaz just divulge every bit of his entire life history to Sardau? Again, it makes no narrative sense at all, except that Richard Knack needs a powerful goodie to help Kaz survive the powerful baddie. I hate to distill into those ridiculous childish terms, but that's the reality of the story. Okay. And then he even messes that up. So we're going to get into that in a second. Okay. So Sardal gives him a dwarven crafted axe, which... Why? <laughs> so the assumption here is that the gods are guiding Kaz. And the gods are then guiding every character who then helps Kaz along the way. This is a divine-inspired story, and we're used to this in Dragonlance. It's really heavy-handed in these older Age of Might type stories, which I don't really understand why it would be any heavier then than it is later on. And arguably, maybe it's not when you reflect on uh, sort of the War of Souls and uh, the Dark Disciple trilogy, because those were, those were divinity stories. Those weren't mortal stories. Um, and so why wouldn't this be the same? You know, why would it be any different? But at some point, as a fan of this campaign world who has played it for years through Dungeons and Dragons first, second, and third, and fourth editions, I made up my own fourth editions and stuff with it. I, uh, I only played mortal stories. I never played the divine stuff where the hero is always saved because Habakkuk or Chislev or, or Morgan or, or, or Chemish wants them to survive. It's always, no, they survive because of their own ingenuity or they didn't survive. And that's it. So why can't these novels follow that same trope of just a mortal doing a mate, like, like stepping up to the plate and just accomplishing heroic deeds because of their own decisions. They did it with Huma, except that Fiz, well not Fizban, but Paladine did actually help Huma out. So why can't they do it with Kaz? I don't know. Anyway, I digress yet again. Uh, so he gives them this dwarven crafted axe and a message to deliver to Argian Raven Shadow, who we have no idea who it is at the moment, only that he is in Vingard Keep, supposedly. They travel to Salamnia together, where Kaz is left alone after Sardal gets to the edge of Salamnia and is like, Whoa, this place sucks. <laughs> I got some other stuff to do, and just sort of pops smoke and vanishes. Um, something casts this great shadow over Kaz, and he comes across a Salamnic knight party that's just been decimated. He discovers one knight alive who is actively being tortured by goblins. Now, he remembers how Huma had saved him from the exact same predicament, and Kaz just could not let this man die. I actually really like this moment, because it sets Kaz up as being someone who wants to repay debts. This very honorable Minotaur who is adjusting his vision of what honor means from what uh, Sargonus and the Minotaur nation has in the Blood Sea Minotaurs have instilled in him and a sort of mixture between what Paladine and the Knights of Slamnia have instructed him in. He is this sort of uh, a, a middle between them, even though he actively prays to Paladine. He overwhelms the goblins and saves the Knights of the Crown, Darius. Now, Darius tells him of the dis uh, tells him the distrust from the orders that he received about Kaz from Vingard Keep and of a massive creature that ended up killing his entire party, something dragon-like. Now, they both head down toward the keep and come to seemingly deserted inn, and inside they discover Delvin and Tessella the cleric. So the town is attacked by the flying creature, and Kaz tries to attack it, but actually chips his axe by hitting it. They leave for Vingard the next morning, and when they arrived, it seems to be abandoned, but it is in fact cursed. Those within the keep end up falling to madness. They find their way to Darius, who tells them about the madness. Kaz sees the Dreadwolf again and is questioned whether or not it's real. Lord Bernard is bringing many knights with him to Vingard after having left and being cured of the madness. So we get this very strict rule that if you're in the keep, you succumb to madness from some source. Once you leave, you are cleared of the madness. Okay, so we got the rules down. Arjun, the elf that Sardanus 
had Kaz deliver a note to, who he doesn't deliver it to, welcomes Kaz and his fellows. He explains that how he came to the keep was to catalog all of the artifacts discovered from Galen Dracos's destroyed citadel. So basically what happened is after they defeated the Dark Queen and Galen Dracos, the knights went to collect up all of the magical artifacts that Galen Dracos either crafted anew or was using against the knighthood so that no other you know, remnant army or anyone else could find them. Why didn't the... Um, why didn't the Wizards of High Sorcery do that? They were already knew about Galen Dracos. They knew about the Renegades. They knew he had crafted his own magical items. Why didn't the Orders of the High Sorcery go in there and take everything? Why would the Knights of Slamnia, an organization who distrusts all magic, go in and collect the magic and not just collect it to like transport off to the Towers of High Sorcery, you know, for the, the, the Wizards of High Sorcery, but actually to just hold in their own vaults. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. But again, we need the goodie to have a baddie. So here we are. He is insistent that the knights began losing their minds and hiding more part of, uh, powerful artifacts from him. Delvin discovers a hidden walkway in the walls, and Argian shares that this is part of the original construction of the keep by Vinus Salamnus. Now, this is how Renard escaped the knights after Huma discovered his treachery in The Legend of Huma. The band of, which they never explained in that book at all. And I like that he went rounded back to, to home base here and he explained, look, Vinus Salamnus built this, he built everything with multiple purposes. He was the one that uh, decided to craft the um, High Claris Tower as a dragon trap, not just a fortress for the knights to sort of kick it in. So everything that he crafted in the Age of Might had a specific dual purpose. And that specific and dual is... <laughs> anyway, that is very interesting to me because it adds complexity to Vinus Salamnus as a character whom we don't really know anything about. Like, we know the legend of the formation of the Knights of Salamnia, but that's kind of it. And it's really nice to get this much more detailed look into his psyche uh, certainly when it comes to the longevity and the construction of these locations on behalf of future generations of knights. He was insistent that the knights began losing their minds and hiding more powerful art. Okay, so I did that. Uh, let's see. The band of minotaurs that are uh, returning home from believing Kaz was drowned comes across the fleeing goblins that Kaz rescued Darius from. Renowned and some worried they head to Vingard Keep to demand Kaz. This is a bold move because this is a band of minotaurs, like 12 minotaurs led by one ogre. And they're like, let's go to the only keep occupied in Salamnia right now of Salamnic Knights, at least the only one that they know of, um, that is like the, the hub of the knighthood. They're mortal enemies and demand that they give him our Minotaur, Kaz. Take some cojones, is all I'm saying. Bennett and the other Salamnic Knights have nearly arrived at the keep at this time, and they're dealing with the shame of realizing what they did after the madness has lifted from them, and the confusion as to why they haven't felt the madness start to seep in the closer they get to the keep again. Now, back inside, Delvin in the walls sees a spider web and creates this giant spider from his imagination, very the Hobbit, cementing the thought that a magical geese is on the keep. Now, this is never explained. They've set up a bunch of this mystery about something is infecting the people of Vingard Keep, turning the Knights of Salamnia evil. Something is, is causing... Um, uh, Delbin to create this spider, which is the supposition of Argian, the elf. But it's never explained why that one part happened. Why the spider was summoned. It was suggested why, but it was never clarified. And once we realize what was actually the cause of the Keep's madness, it even then further demyst or further mystifies why that spider ever existed in the first place. It was very strange. Uh, hi, Gaines. Thanks for joining live. Appreciate you, team. Matt, always good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. Argian brings everyone food after they rescued the Kender, and he takes the Kender as everyone else eats. Now, the food is poisoned, and everyone is saved by the Cleric of Mishakal. So, Argian is now the bad guy. He's not the good guy. 
cataloging magic items. He's actually trying to kill Kaz and all of Kaz's companions, except for the thief, in order to get past the locks the Knights of Salamnia put in place of the artifacts of Galen Dracos that they've been holding off from him. They head to the High Cleric's throne room after they've been healed by the cleric to speak with Lord Oswell and find that the knights guarding him and the Dreadwolves attacking the guards are all illusions. Kaz helps break Oswell out of his illusion and he reveals that the elf Argan is behind everything. He's the one turning everyone mad. He's the one creating all of these illusions because he's trying to get Galen Dracos' treasure hoard. They head to the treasury where the elf brought Delbin to open the many locks that the knights put around the artifacts of Galen Dracos. They arrive in battle Argian as Delbin opens the locks and the elf enters and reveals Galen's dra uh, green orb, nearly together emanating power. So the orb that Galen Dracos was using to draw in to Kesis from the abyss in full for godly force, all of her power, and his plan was to then trap her and, and use that power for himself. But... It's a it's alive. It's all put together except for this one little shard that's in Argian's pocket. So Argian pulls out a figurine, and the stone dragon turns into well, the, the figurine turns into the big stone dragon, filling up as much of the area in the treasure room and the basement at large, breaking ceilings and walls. The knights try to fight it to no avail. Kaz is being called by Argian to help him merge with the crystal, uh, the green sphere as he's dying and needs the magic to control the dragon. So Kaz is faced with this choice. Do I help Argian stop the dragon by merging him with this green sphere, giving him Galen Dracos' power? Or <laughs> do I not? And he chooses to give Argian all of the power of Galen Dracos. Of all of the stupid decisions made by any character in all of Dragonlance, I cannot think of any that mirrors this choice that he makes. Like, yeah, you may be killed by this dragon, and you may not, you don't know, but you know for a fact that if you help this guy merge with this orb, he's gonna have all of the power of Galen Dracos, who nearly brought the Queen of Darkness into Kryn. And that's what he opts to do. It's insane. It makes no sense at all. Okay. So Kaz, feeling as if he has no choice, which again, makes no sense, helps him and then collects his friends to flee the sto stone dragon's dis uh, destruction. When they get to the surface, the dragon bursts through the building with Argian riding on top of him and they fly away. So good job, Kaz. Stupid. Uh, Lord Oswell orders the remaining knights to seal up the keep as best as they can as Lord Bennett arrives with his 200 knights. Kaz and Oswell share the stories with Bennett and both Kaz and Bennett ride out with their friends and 50 soldiers to give chase to Argian. I actually really appreciate the shame that these knights are feeling because the knighthood, the knights of Salamnia are an ideal that's impossible to live up to as a mortal human, Right? But it's an ideal that they strive to live up to. And when they find themselves failing, they are literally their worst critics. And, well, maybe not post-cataclysm. <laughs> because they were definitely run out of their houses by their worst critics then. But now, for in the Age of Might, they are their worst critics. And I like, I like, I like personal... You know, characters taking personal inventory and judging themselves more than I like external characters judging others. Because no one knows you better than yourself, right? No one can feel the shame for your own actions more than yourself. And for an organization to put themselves on such a pedestal and to fall so far, the only one who can truly feel that gravity are the ones that fell and hit that ground. And I love that they play that up in this. They could very easily say, well, we messed up, but we're going to move forward with the best of intentions. But no, they don't. They're like, oh, I messed up. I'm the worst. What is that? I just, I, I appreciate it. Anyway. Uh, Kaz suddenly rem remembers now the parchment that Sardal gave him to give to Argian. This is stupid Kaz number two. <sighs> Um, he's given uh, this precious axe 
by the guy who saved his life from drowning, right? So there, there's reason for him to have this guy in the forefront of his mind. He would be dead if it weren't for this elf that gave him this magical axe. So there's two things. But the third thing is the elf also gave you a fucking note. I'm sorry, a freaking note to hand off to someone else. Why would you not remember to do that? And then when you do remember it, you just think, hey, I'm going to open this because I'm curious. And especially when he realized he couldn't break the seal and he had to work at it with daggers and stuff in order to break the seal. At no time do you think maybe I shouldn't open this? Maybe that elf who was so good and helped me in such a good way knew that this other elf was bad? Just stupid. Just no critical thinking at all. And it was just stupid. So what happens? He breaks open the seal. He, he unleashes this trap that would have trapped uh, Argian, which would have prevented all of this from happening at all. Right? He is the reason. Kaz is the reason this is happening. Because of his own stupidity, his own forgetfulness, and his own just... I just have to say stupidity again. It, it, it makes no sense why he didn't remember that. Especially when they had knights of laying around, <laughs> like just stretching out on the ground. Like you don't remember that note in your pack? Uh, anyway, so he opens it and he traps himself. Now, Sardal ends up releasing Kaz from the trap and they're joined by the great wolf, Greymere. Now this does not explicitly say it's a beast lord, but as far as Dragonlance lore is concerned, I think this is another beast lord. I kind of dig it. Anyway, Greymere is this gigantic wolf and on who is acting on behalf of Habakkuk. He delivers uh, Sardal and Kaz to Argian's mountain, where they sneak up to the keep, only to be discovered, and Kaz is taken by the stone dragon, and consequently delivered to Argian in the spirit of Galen Dracos from the orb. That's right, Galen Dracos is alive, in a manner of speaking, as I said before, in a wraith-like form, sort of attached to this orb. I am genuinely curious why no one has ever brought up this orb later. And I'll get into it at the end here. I'm almost over. But this is an artifact that would be great to bring back. They brought back the dragon orbs when they were crafted and used and buried. Why don't they drink, bring back this green orb? Like that... And, and did they? Is this just, it, maybe did the, the Orders of High Sorcery use this orb as basis to create the dragon orbs from? See, these little things I would love to, I'd love to know, because I don't know if it's ever been addressed. And if you guys know that it has, please let me know. I'd appreciate it. Delbin witnesses Kaz being taken and moves after him as the Knights of Salamnia fight their way through Argian's forces. Kaz passes out from the pain and, again, very convenient passing out. This is what Kaz does throughout this whole book. It gets on over his head, he passes out, and he wakes up in a more fortuitous position. So he passes out, and he wakes up in a chained cell. More fortuitous as in he's not dead. Argian is clearly now in control, as Galen, Galen Dracos is still in the orb, albeit in a wraith-like state. Kaz breaks out of his cell and finds Sardal sneaking through the halls looking for him. They are all caught by Argian, who kills Sardal and transport Kaz to the orb room. This is something that makes no sense to me. Not only is Sardal a powerful enough uh, magician to enter into the keep when no one else could, but he could sneak around the keep when no one else could find him, but somehow Argian dropped some rocks on him and that killed his ass? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, clearly, a, a, a tunnel collapse would kill anyone. So that's not the point. The point is, is he's a powerful magician who has shields all around him at all times, it seems like. Why not? You just don't have to kill him off, is all. Not, not only is him dying off not furthering the story, it doesn't even provide any real consequence because we didn't really get to know him at all. It was always suggested that he was something greater than he actually was. Maybe he was an avatar of one of the gods or something. But then for him just to be offed, you don't even really feel bad about it. It was just like this random uber powerful character that was just offed by another uber powerful character. Again, the consequences don't feel like they're there. 
even though he died. So then Dracos takes possession of Argian's body, who then resists him, and Delbin enters to try and rescue Kaz. The stone dragon and some guards burst in, and it is all-out battle royale for survival. Delbin seems to be killed. Again, supposed consequence, which doesn't actually mean anything. And Kaz fights off the dragon and eventually kills it. So the fact that he actually chipped the magical axe that is summoned to him whenever he thinks about it on the stone dragon the first time he confronted it, that doesn't matter anymore. He now can cut through the dragon's head. Again, it's never explained at all why he can do this. Why at one time it actually breaks his axe and now it doesn't break it. And the only hint about why this could possibly work is because it's belief. <laughs> And I can't help think back to when I was a little kid, little Adam, watching the Care Bear movie and them linking arms and saying the Care Bears stare and this magical light beaming out of the Care Bears bodies, defeating evil or whatever. I don't actually remember it. I just remember the Care Bear stare chant. That's what Cass just did. I believe in this axe and that's all I need. It's the same stupid reason why I hated the short story, the story that, Ta Kaz, uh, that Taz promised he would never ever tell about the dragon lances. How they don't even have to be divine at all. They could just literally be a stick. And if you just believe enough, then th that's all you need. It's the stupidest story element I could ever imagine being in a story. And they bring it back in this, supposedly. All right, so he believes it's magical and it can cut through the dragon's head, and so it can. It is so stupid. Okay, that being said. Um, <laughs> where is this? Stone dragon, some guards burst in his battle. So, so Delvin seems to be killed and Kaz fights off the dragon and eventually kills the dragon. It falls on the still fighting Argian and Dracos, crushing them, and Kaz gives in to the dire wounds and once again passes out. So, Kaz should have died from the dragon. That was the gravity of the moment, just like Huma before him. He, you know, of course, Huma was going against Queen of Darkness, so it's not exactly the same thing, but still. Huma dies from his encounter with this great, magnificent deity avatar, right? Kaz should have died. But it wouldn't have fit the story, and so, again, he just passes out. He's the fainting minotaur. That's what they do. It's like cow tipping narratively. So, <laughs> the author tips over Kaz, who fa uh, falls asleep, wakes up perfectly healed, because there's no consequences. He saw his kender fellow, whom he loves more than anyone else in the story, uh, die, and he's magically healthy again. The big bad guy who was dragging in the Queen of Darkness again, who made this new pact with the Queen of Darkness to allow his essence to still maintain its proximity with his orb, and Argian fighting for possession of his body. Like this uber-powerful creature, the Fisted Nanalus, to the story, and this ma uh, thief mage who, throughout the entire story, everyone has always said he sucks at magic. He can somehow fight off the most powerful magic user of all on Kryn. Uh, up until this point, he fights off his body better than Linda Blair in Exorcist. Like, it's ridiculous. And then they're so focused on fighting each other internally that they don't notice this gigantic stone dragon just crushes them. And then it's just like Dorothy. She sees the feet curl up after she landed on the Wicked Witch, and they're like, hey, let's take those slippers and go home. And that's literally what they did. They went home. So they wake up. Everything's fine now. Birds are chirping. Everyone's happy, except there's a ruckus outside. And so Kaz wakes up to the knights arguing over his sleeping body. Um, everyone acts like they're surprised that he survived, but Kaz has survived so many things that he should have died from. Everyone should just expect him to always survive. And then uh, they realize that the minotaurs that have been hunting him the entire story are just right outside the tent, like... Give us Kaz, we must take him home because he is a dishonorable person. Not only did he stand beside Huma and fight off the Queen of Darkness, rescuing all of Kryn, then 
He fights off Galen Dracos and Argian body mixed up all together and a stone dragon to prevent once again the Queen of Darkness from entering and taking over all of Kryn. But they still think he's dishonorable? He doesn't have any courage? He's a coward? What? Now they, they make up for this in the fact that, yeah, there's two or three of the Minotaurs with them. They're like, mm, I don't know. I think he's an honorable person after all. <laughs> it doesn't make any None of this is so stupid. Okay. So Skurn, the leader of this Minotaur party, who is actually not really the leader, the Moloch, the ogre is the leader. But anyway, Skurn, who's the most pissed off at him, um, challenges him to one-on-one -on -one combat because ultimately he has to fight to regain his honor. That's just Minotaur society, right? Um, supposedly he's going to die in this because all of the Minotaurs are going to fight him, but only a couple said that, mm, well, maybe I'll fight him with you if you want. But then Skurn was like, no, screw it. I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> screw it. We'll do it live, right? So he goes mano in mano with Kaz, a famed gladiator. I don't know why Skurn thinks he can actually defeat him, but he does, and he doesn't. He does think that he can beat him, and he doesn't beat him. Kaz, of course, beats him, but then when it's like at the very end, he's like, just kill me, kill me, life's not worth living. He's like, no, no, it would be a waste. And he just walks away. It's that Karate Kid move where um, uh, the two trainers uh, are like ready to... Uh, uh, Mr. Miyagi is ready to kill, um, oh, what's his name? Creed. And he has him down, like, at the very beginning of Karate Kid 2, I think, or the very ending of Karate Kid 1. Um, and he's, like, uh, outside of the tournament, and he's ready to kill him. He's like, yeah! Honk! And honks his nose. That's what Kaz did to Skurn. It was really, really... I, I mean, he's in character for Kaz. So, of course, he did it. But it was just a... It's a trite thing to do at this point, narratively. Um, at that point, when it was written. Okay, so then Kaz ends up riding into the darkness or off into the distance with the, the two minotaurs that he trained when they were kids. One of them, Haladi, is like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> There's going to be something there. And his best friend, Delvin the Kender. And no one can understand. And not even Kaz can really understand why he loves this Kender so much. But it's because he's a Kender. Like, he's this adorable, cute little kid that you've decided to take under your wing. It's the, it's the Grogu to Din Djarin in The Mandalorian. You know, he's like, he's the, the, the cute draw for the story, and he's great. All right. I've shit all over this story. I actually really like this story. I'm just giving critical analysis here. So, this is a great story about friendship and perception. Everyone has a different idea of what honor is and how it relates to current versus past deeds. Kaz misses his friends, Huma uh, particularly, but he's surrounded by many new ones, the Kender Delbin being his closest. He has a great love of life and experience, and if there's any takeaway from this novel, it's just that. It's to experience life and be open to friendship when you're offered it and take chances. Yes, you may fail and you may find yourself in trouble, but that's what living life is all about. I find myself reflecting on those friends I've made in life, and I cherish them even more after having read this. Because friendship, being close to other human beings, is not easy for everyone, and it doesn't happen for everyone, for whatever reason. And so when you do find those intimate connections of just genuine friendship, you, you have to nourish them. You have to feed them and and appreciate them and that's what this story told me and i that was the biggest takeaway of anything is is delbin and kaz's relationship and how much i love it and how much it made me realize that i genuinely love my friends and i'm so fortunate to have those people around me whom i call friends none of them know about this channel either <laughs> for whatever reason which is weird um because I'm a bad friend. That's what, That's really what it comes down to. Anyway, this is a must-read for any dragon. It's funny for me saying this because I just shit all over it. But this is a must-read for any Dragonlance fan or fan of The Legend of Huma. It is a flawed third act with Argian Dracos being all-powerful and still unable to save himself. But I can look past it because the rest of the novel was fantastic. So what did you guys think? All right, so what do we have here? Uh, you love Dragonlance when you were a teenager, your big brother... Uh, Big Brother's friends got you into D&D, &D, then introduced you to Dragonlance. 
Hot take, Dragonless is just a great world of fiction as Lord of the Rings. I agree, High Games Drifter. I really agree. It's great. With proper writers, it has the potential of being even better. I agree with that, too. The, I think the Margaret Weiss, in my interview with her, said it brilliantly. You know, she was like, look, Dragonlance is something different to everyone. And what you might think of it may not be what other people think of it. And you may not like how they see it or how they think about it. But what you do appreciate about it is what you should be focusing on. I'm extrapolating here. And I think that's right. I may not like every aspect of Dragonlance stories, but there's always going to be a kernel that I can pull out of it that I do genuinely appreciate. No matter how flawed a story is, um, the fact is, is that all stories share similar tropes, and that's because we're human beings and we're used to similar stories. We're used to that sort of hero archetype, going on a journey and returning home after they learned and faced danger and stuff. So you're always going to find those similar tropes in every story, especially with heroic fiction like this. Expect it. And if it bothers you, look past it because there's other stuff in here. There's a lot of really wonderful world building in this. This idea of this pre-cataclysm Kryn, Ancelon specifically, where there are no real boundaries for the Quillinisti Elves. They just sort of go wherever they want. It's other people that define boundaries for them. And it forces me to think about how narrow-minded a species we are as human beings because we put boundaries on everything for no reason. If you're born on one side of a, a boundary 10 feet away from me, somehow you're different or less than, which makes zero sense. And it actually works against our own human being best interest, self-interest, but we still do it. And make, it's just ridiculous. It, the same thing with this story. The Knights of Slamnia is... The, I'm sorry, the Knights of Slamnia draw these manufactured borders. Uh, Aragoth draws these manufactured borders. But other races don't care about it. They just do what they want. Ogres, they do what they want. Elves, they do what they want. It's just the humans that seem preoccupied with this idea of confined space. Of It's safe right here. It's dangerous right there. Why? You're making it up. What? Just ignore it. <laughs> like, why are you focused on that so much? It makes no sense. Um, yeah, what am I talking about here? You hope Knack remembers that Kaz wrote a bronze dragon. Yeah, dude. That's the thing. I miss that bronze dragon. I want to learn more about that bronze dragon. They had such a great connection and this great scenes in The Legend of Huma where they were both like rearing to go. Like that... That made me want to see them sort of go off in the future, you know, just have an adventure of their own. I'd read it. A character with less than pure past who becomes better definitely inspires. Yeah. And that's the other thing is that the only reason why Kaz had a less than good past is because he's seeing it through the human's lens. If you're a minotaur, he had a perfect past. You know, he was a champion in the arena. He would have been a leader of his people if he would have stayed there under the ogre rule. And the ogres were actively ruling them and the majority of all minotaurs were seemingly okay with it because Sargaz was okay with the Queen of Darkness doing her thing. So if you can't use perspective and see theirs and understand how disparate it is from everyone else's, then you can never fully understand why they do what they do. This is something that every human being should be able to do, and that's put themselves in someone else's position and understand perspective from a different position. This is the, the poison of humanity, is lack of perspective. And in a story, seeing a character who then has these both experiences is able to, to see the perspective of the knights and see the perspective of the Blood Sea Minotaurs that he was raised in and find some sort of happy medium in between actually makes the character infinitely better. And it's not because one's bad and one's good. It's because the individual character has growth. And that's the most important thing in life is personal growth. At least to me. Do you think these legend novels and stuff were sort of rushed in order to have products on shelves? I do think that had something to do with it. Um, when you look at the, the years that these were released, they were really close together. This was uh, Legend of Human was Heroes Trilogy 1 and 
Chasm Minotaur was Heroes Trilogy 2, and each story that was released in the first three and the second three were sort of unofficial sequels to each other, prequels and sequels to each other. So a lot of what we see with Dragonlance whenever you talk to any of the authors, it's that someone from up high came to them and said, hey, you got a, you got a story for Dragonlance? And they're like, uh, yeah, sure. They're like, okay, write it. You got a deadline. And that was it. And so they just, you know, when it came to the War of the Lands, that was all mapped out. Everything else was up for grabs. And so we did see this huge narrative land grab happening with authors saying, I want to take this part of Crin and talk about this part of the history and I'm going to define it for everyone else. And then another person comes and says, I don't really agree with all of that. So I'm going to change it a little bit in the future and I'm going to make this part mine. So what, what Dragonlance really could have benefited from and TSR never could have been able to do it back in the day was have a story group that just said, look, these are the rules for this world and this is what you must follow in every story. And these things are, you cannot change. And the, the, the schisms that happened in Dragonlance were because there was no consistent story group. And they kept changing everything. They even changed the size of Ancelon. <laughs> I mean, they really, they sort of went all over the place. And that's why it's not until 3.5 materials that you see this sort of culmination of all of the disparate stories wrapped up into one solid Dragonlance narrative. And so for, for OGs like me, who just love first edition Dragonlance and that, that sort of the purity of Dragonlance in that age, it's hard to reconcile those very big differences later on, but you take what you like and you forget about what you don't like, you know, in life. That's what you got to do. All right, so Minotaur tipping. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Seems like there should be revisions by true Dragonlance fans. I don't know. You know, I, I'm happy with where it ended up. And even with these stories that, you know, they're, they're meant for youth. <laughs> I'm a grown man. I'm going to be much more picky than a kid is. And certainly, I read this the first time when I was a kid, and I didn't see any of the flaws that I'm seeing in it now. So, you know... To the, to the audience that it was written to, I think it succeeded in what it was trying to do. And that's sell books. I'm so happy you found this channel. So nerd friends. <laughs> hey, Sparky. Thanks for joining live, man. Yeah. That's why none of my other friends know about this channel. Because <laughs> I geek out about it way too much. Way more than I should. Uh, High Gains Drifter, this channel rules because you can tell he's passionate about the Dragonlance. And not just a turd looking for subs. <laughs> I actually lose subs. Like, I, you know, I can see the trends and videos I put out, opinions that I share, and I've, I've lost a lot of subs because of my obsessiveness over this campaign world. Which is weird, because why would you sub to a campaign world channel and then unsub because you didn't like that person's perspective about it? Like, you should... There's still enough in here that... I don't know. Anyway. Um, hey, I... Kuchi... I hope I said that right. Thanks for joining live. Great to see you. Member right there. You can see by the icon. It is awesome. So, oh, dude, and because uh, d, d you can tweak stuff and make the campaign, you're running exactly the way you want story-wise. Yeah. So you never read this one. You always like the character of Kaz. Um, Vincent, thanks for joining live. Kaz is awesome. Kaz as a character is fantastic. Again, because of his growth. He has more growth in the, the two stories than anyone else. Like, no one else can even touch Kaz. Huma was always the same guy. He, he had the same aspirations, and even through adversity and struggles, he maintained those aspirations. Kaz hated the Knights. He wanted nothing to do with it. And he ended up befriending every one of them, earning their greatest respect. I mean, and, and he himself is the, the reason of that, not just because of his deeds, but because of how he treated them. And that's as another mortal on the, the on Kryn, who is just as flawed as he is, who uh, he may not agree with, but he understands. It all comes down to perspectives, right? I really love it. Um, plus players can shape so much. Yeah, I love playing a game in this world, and it's been years since I have. And I really want to start another one because... You, you can do anything. And there's, you know, with those uh, Dungeons & Dragons adventure board game uh, episodes that I'm putting together, I'm making up the story for those. You know, those aren't with the board games. I just want, I want to tell a Dragonlance story 
in whatever medium that I'm going to be using, right? So with Dungeons and Dragons adventure board games, adventure system board games, I'm going to tell Dragonlance stories with them, even though those are not Dragonlance board games. We, uh, as soon as XDM uh, 2 comes out, I'm going to do an XDM Dragonlance story in it. I'm going to do a fifth age with the cards and everything Dragonlance story um, the, with the Saga system rules, uh, Saga role-playing system rules. Uh, I'm going to do a first edition story. And I think those just be like short little one-off adventures and stuff. But the fact is that I want to, I want to show that you don't need a 5e source book or campaign in order to tell a 5e story if that's what you want to play for Dragonlance. I personally don't. But if you want to, you don't need that. You have all of the uh, role-playing stories out there. You have all of the source books already out there. Just take what you love about it, discard what you don't, and tell your own Dragonlance story. And that's what's so great about this world is that not only do we have different eras, we have different um, uh, regions on the planet, different uh, continents with different, uh, very different cultures, even within different, in the same race, you have different cultures, which is so rich and ripe for storytelling. I think it's fantastic. All right, you found uh, Farron novels more disparate than Dragonlance, more so now with 5e, but you worry that if Dragonlance gets back into 5e, narrative fold. Yeah, I mean, there's no way we can really tell whether it's going to be good or bad until it, it's released, you know? And let's, let's just say, worst case scenario, it sucks. Let's say in every fan's eyes, Wizard of the Coast ruins Dragonlance, right? Let's just put it out there. What if? Who cares? We still have everything else that's been out there, that's been released. Just because first edition content is first edition system doesn't mean that you can't reference those same stories that you love so much or those, so, those same game arcs, you know, or story options. You can do that. It doesn't matter. You don't have to like what they released to love this world and what is in the world. Um, yeah, I did a whole I did a whole story on the Irda, uh, Benjamin. So uh, you can always check that out. It's in one of the Dragon That Setting uh, playlist. Um, there's a novel that I'll eventually read, the Lost Histories of Crin series. That one book deals with the Irda, so I, I'll read that. And if it has anything that really jumps out as worth talking about, then I'll share that. But the history of the Irida is out there, so check that out. It, it's a good one. I really liked it. I, lo I like the Irida a lot. Mix that with um, uh, the first Lands of Crin, where I talk about the Irida's uh, land masses, and you get a pretty solid understanding of the Irida. Um, all right. Well, that's all I had today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in live and uh, sort of geeking out with me over Dragonlance. I know I can get a little weird about it, but I have fun. And that's what this is all about. I'm just trying to have a little bit of fun on a Wednesday. <laughs> and uh, with Kaz the Minotaur, great character, not the best stories, definitely worth the read. Check it out. All right. Well, anyway, that is that it for my review of Kaz the Minotaur by Richard A. Knack. As a sequel, did it live up to Legend of Huma for you? Do you enjoy the reviews that I'm putting out there? Feel free to email me at info at jlsaga.com or comment below. I'd like to take a moment and remind you to subscribe to this YouTube channel, ring the bell and get notified about upcoming videos and click the like button. This all goes to help other Dragonlance fans learn about this channel and its content. And always remember that this channel is all about celebrating the wonderful world of the Dragonlance saga. Thank you for joining me in the celebration. My name is Adam and until next time, Slangevar.